I'm glad to be here tonight. The presence of the Lord is here. We welcome you in this place, Father. I ask that as, as you invade this territory, because it belongs to you, that anything in our hearts that would establish any kind of roadblock that would keep you from being within us, everything you want to be, just tear that down and touch us in the deepest places of our lives. Be with us tonight. Bless this house. Bless the Hillsdens. Bless their ministry team. Bless everyone that you've called here to make a difference in this ancient and important and beautiful city to you. Thank you for your covenant with this land, Lord, and with this people that you'll never break. We thank you that you're working all things to your good and that we're privileged to be a part of it. And we thank you for it in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 Well, I'm happy to be here tonight. Stephen told you a little bit about uh, what we're doing. Actually, uh, we came a few days early and uh, we have met some of these friends that God has really sovereignly connected us with in Dallas that are connected here. And so we're uh, going to meet some people in the next day or two and have yesterday and today um, with things that we want to see happen uh, for the people of Israel uh, in a big way, and to be with you all. And then we have a group of about 50, one bus full, uh, coming to join us Tuesday from our church that will go on a tour, many of them first-time visitors. So they're looking forward to it. We're looking forward to it. We have some great pastors in that group, too, one from San Francisco, Dr. Jeff Garner and his wife, uh, a couple of our staff pastors, one of our worship pastors, and so we're going to have a great time together here. Thanks for the nice weather in January. Not, not bad, huh? So uh, we're grateful. It's great to see the Hillsdens again. We, we love Wayne and Ann and, and Michael and all the family. Haven't met the baby yet, but uh, we're looking forward to that. And, and so many of you. Were, how many of you were here last time a year ago when I was here and shared with you? Any of you that were here then? A uh, number of you. And how many of you were not? I just wanted to see if you're going to participate either way. <laughs> well, I'm glad. So come by and see us anytime you're in Dallas. Uh, Dallas is a, a great place to be because it's right in the middle of Texas. Texas is the Lone Star State, greatest state in the union. We say if you weren't born in Texas, you need to be born again. There is some talk in Texas of secession. Might not be a bad idea, but, uh, but we're all good. There are some of you here from other places in the United States. I, I, felt, like, I felt like you were, because I, I felt a, a spirit just set on me when I, when I was talking about Texas being the greatest state in the union. But, uh, I, uh, I want to talk to you tonight uh, for a few minutes from the word of the Lord. I, I want to introduce Kathy, my wife of 41 and a half years that's with me tonight. Kathy, please stand and give people a wave. <laughs> Kathy, is, uh, Kathy is my very best friend, mother of our children, grandmother to six of our grandkids, six grandkids, and a huge part of our ministry, a real uh, prayer warrior. I met her as a great singer. I was such an awesome preacher when I came into her life that she retired from singing. I can hardly get her to sing anymore because, uh, you know, we're really empowering the next generation and looking forward to and enjoy, really enjoy what they do. But uh, I'm thankful for Kathy and so glad that she's, uh, she's with me on this trip and it's great to share the time together. Thank you, Stephen, for sharing and it's nice to have Erica with us. Erica's uh, family is also in the ministry with us on the pastoral team, uh, on the staff at home. And uh, we have a great, great time. Our daughter, Amy, is, uh, is speaking this morning in Dallas as I speak here. It's the greatest joy in my life other than the Lord and his Holy Spirit to work with my family in ministry. Uh, you know, 
uh, this was the way mankind did it for millennia. And then in, since the Industrial Revolution, there has been in most of us, especially you millennials and younger people than me that are here, you don't know any different than this because the, since the Industrial Revolution, uh, women started going to work, leaving the home, and children quit working with their father. For thousands of years, young people learned the careers of their fathers and their forefathers. So this is part of the degeneration of the family. And so there's a great book I could recommend that you read. I forget the author's name right now, but the name of the book, it's a corporate book, but it's called In Praise of, of, In Praise of Nepotism. And his point is actually, don't buy into the idea that there's something inherently wrong with your family working with you in your business or your ministry or your life. It's actually rewarding and wonderful. It doesn't mean that you have to show unfair favoritism, but it's a joy to work with my family. I'm glad that, and I couldn't call them, but I'm glad that they work with us in the ministry. You know, a few years ago, I was in South Korea, and I was at dinner with six pastors, four from the U.S. and two from South Korea, and one of them, the senior pastor of the largest church in the world. And he said to one of my friends who's from California, he said, I'm very jealous of you. And he said, how could you be jealous of me? I have a couple thousand people in my church and you have about a half a million. And he said, no, no, I'm not talking about the size of our church. He said, you have two sons and both of them love the church, love the ministry and work with you in the ministry. And neither one of my sons work with me in the ministry and hate it and don't have any part in the ministry. And I would trade places with you today if my sons worked with me in the ministry and loved the work of God. It's something to be valued. And I'm thankful for it. I talked to Pastor Wayne a few days ago. I appreciate him honoring me to ask me to speak in this great church. I did tell him, however, because I know this is a crossroads for so many ministries that come here to visit Israel. And I said, I'm your friend. I'm for what you're doing. We're going to continue blessing King of Kings. And I don't have to preach when I come here. I would love to just meet you for coffee and hang out, but I don't have to preach. And he's like, no, I would like for you to, and I'd like to tell you what we're doing. So he told me about your series that you're in from the book of Romans. And he said, you can preach on anything you want, but if you want to participate in that, We'll put you right in the rotation, and we'll keep our series going. And you get to preach on sin. <laughs> I said, man, what a great opportunity. I forgot about that. I say that a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but for those of you raised in evangelical Christianity or Pentecostalism like I, my parents were not, they didn't grow up in the church. My parents were raised as American heathens. They came from good people and good hardworking coal miners in Southern Ohio, but they didn't know the Lord. The first church they were ever in was when they got married, in a church they rented to be married in. Then when I was two years old, they, they dramatically found the Lord and were filled with the Holy Spirit in a very conservative little Pentecostal church. And I have a special place in my heart for that, and there's, a, there's, a, there's something to be said for their fire and for their anointing. There are some other things that they had a little wrong, but all of us do. And I would say that in those days, there was probably an overemphasis on sin, and that's all they ever preached about. And now there's probably an underemphasis. So the pendulum swings too far either way. Because I don't think you're supposed to be sin conscious 24-7 and everything be wrong. Like one of my friends said, because you know in our church, and they named sin. <clears throat> you know, they didn't just teach about sin, they named it. And they called people out. But you know, smoking was a sin, and drinking was a sin, and dancing was a sin, and movies were a sin. In fact, if you were in a theater and Jesus came back, you weren't going. Uh, it, it didn't matter if you were watching Bambi in the theater. <laughs> You were going straight to hell, do not collect $200, do not pass go, just like the Monopoly game. So one of my friends that came out of a similar church, 
said that his church just put a big sign up on the back of the stage that said no. <laughs> if, if, if you're even thinking about it, the answer is no. It's wrong. We couldn't go to the bowling alley. I couldn't play a pinball machine. Everything was a sin. But isn't it wonderful that we're delivered because now nothing is a sin. So Pastor Wayne said, if you'd like to participate in our series, you can preach on the segment that's coming up, sin. Wow, that'd be an interesting subject. So if you weren't raised like me, you don't even understand what's funny, but you don't have to be raised in a little Pentecostal church. Some of you are raised Catholic, and you know about that too, because Catholics know about sin too. One, one of my friends said, we went to a church that believed in backsliding. He said, do you know about the doctrine of backsliding? He said, our church believed in the doctrine of back backsliding and practiced it on a regular basis. <laughs> so I don't know what kind of church you were raised in, but almost every church has some similarities in their background. One of them is guilt. Churches love to specialize in guilt, when in fact, that's the whole reason the Lord came, is to get that all off of us. And he that the Son makes free is free indeed. But we're going to talk about sin. I want to talk to you tonight about, from Romans chapter 1, and we'll read a couple of passages there as a part of our series, but I want to talk to you about sin and a different kind of judgment. I think I'm going to share something with you tonight. Now, you may be one of those people, and there's one in every crowd, I've been at churches before, or my own, where I will preach something that absolutely, now this doesn't happen always, sometimes you just have to open a can of something that's, that you're recycling, but sometimes God will absolutely give me a download from heaven of a revelation that nobody but the archangels know about. And when you get finished with it, somebody in that church is going to come up and say, that was really good, Mike, I've been thinking about that and preaching it for years. And they don't even preach. So you know that, that what you came up with wasn't that unique. But I do feel like there's something that for someone, you're going to find something unique about this tonight, because I'm going to talk about sin from this chapter and a different kind of judgment. What is sin, first of all? I'm not going to take very long, so I'm going to really run through this. So, so, so get your mind going quickly. Now, you probably think I already talk real slow because I am from Texas, but to me, I'm talking really fast right now. But I realize a lot of people talk faster than me because I can't hear that fast. <laughs> like one of my friends is a private pilot, and he's from Texas, and he and I talk just alike. And he was flying in recently to New York City, and he could not understand. I was flying with him in his plane. He was telling me this story. He could not understand the flight controller and what he was saying. And it was getting really frustrating so finally, Paul just cued his mic and he said to him, Sir, do you hear the speed with which I'm speaking to you? That's the same speed that I hear with. I don't understand what you're saying. Slow down. We talk slow in Texas. But I'm going to speed it up a little bit. What is sin? Well, in the Abrahamic context, sin means to violate God's will. So whatever God's will is on a subject, a violation of that is what the scripture calls sin. From the original language, as you've probably heard, sin means to miss the mark, as in a marksman that's shooting a target. Sin is shooting everywhere but the target, missing the target God has established. You know, there's, you've heard this, there's original sin from the garden and the curse that came with that, and that's primarily Western kind of thought. There's minor sins and mortal sins that send you to hell, and there's some that you just need to repair. According to Judaism, Judaism sees any violation of the 613 commandments as a sin. In Romans chapter 1, we will begin with verse number 16, after Paul finishes a lot of his greeting, and he says in verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. For everyone who believes, for the Jew first, say amen with me, amen. for the Jew first and also for the Greek. 
For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And that's the journey we're all on, isn't it? Don't let me insult you tonight. I'll get right in there with you. But I'm going to tell you that everyone in this room is missing it somewhere. And everyone in this room is deceived about something. There is something you think that you know the truth about and it isn't the truth at all. Now, it might be a minor thing. For instance, you may be deceived about your transportation home. You drove a car here and you think you're going to drive straight home when in fact you may have a flat on the way home and you're not going to drive straight home at all. Now, but you don't know that. You don't know that. There's things that all of us operate in a partial knowledge of and sometimes we get surprised because all of us are deceived about something and all of us are also wrong about something. But that's the beauty of that phrase right there, from faith to faith. Because if you're serving God with all that you know, God is happy with you, pleased with you. It's just like my grandchildren that Stephen and Erica's two children, right now at seven and five, and they're a delight to us, and they're wonderful. But guess what? They're not perfect, because as children, there are things they don't even know how to do. Neither one of them can drive me to church. Neither one of them can read my text or my notes. Neither one of them could preach for me. Neither one of them could cook a full meal. But they're still wonderful. Why? Because they're great for where they are. And that's kind of the way God works with all of us. He's happy with you if you're where you're supposed to be for who you are and where you are. But he's still intent on moving you to a next level of faith. Where there'll be a new measurement of maturity and a new requirement placed on you that he doesn't, an expectation that he doesn't have for you right now. Does that make sense? From faith to faith. Even that is God's grace. Grace. Now in verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now here's what I'm going to do. I I highlighted these. There's a number of them and I'm going to give them to you. But how God sees sin is much of the time much different than we see sin. In fact, I mentioned uh, uh, tongue-in-cheek some of the sins that were kind of the favorites of the church that I grew up in. Some of the churches, there was a little Baptist church down the street, and the preacher there used to say, you ain't supposed to he'd preach against sin, and he was a real simple a coal miner, and he would say, you ain't supposed to smoke, chew, or run with girls that do. So he had, he had specifically, do you all have a sense of humor here? Or am I, are you, are you, uh, see, here's what I teach in my church. When I tell something that's even marginally funny, but the intention is that you laugh, if you don't have a really deep, wonderful, rich belly laugh, there's deep sin in your life. So watch, <laughs> the next time I tell something funny, I'm going to be watching really closely, and then I can identify who needs to repent, praise the Lord, right at the end of this service. So let me talk to you about how God sees sin, because ours seem to be centered on specific sinful acts that the world calls vices. So the old church used to talk about, do you smoke, or do you chew, or do you dance, or do you, those are all, those, or do you you drink too much? Those are, those are vices. But, but God doesn't mention any of those here, but notice what he mentions. Here's what he, here's how he sees sin. He starts with the first one I just read, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. You can see God in the glory of creation. Everyone knows that. Even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Because, here's the second one that God sees as sin. Although although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Here's the next one. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And that's because of pride. And change the glory of the, this, here's the next one, and change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four footed animals and creeping things, and we would call that idolatry. 
And the pagans and the ancients used to carve things out of stone or rock or worship the sun or as the Egyptians did, the Nile or the, or the, or the beetle or whatever. Now, now it's boats and cars and, and women and money and we still make idols of things that aren't worthy of being called God. God calls that sin. Now, when he finishes this list, suppressing the truth, not glorifying God, unthankful, professing to be wise, which is pride, and making God, their God, into an image that is seen. You know, one of the beautiful things about the God that we worship, who manifested himself in his only begotten son, Yeshua, that we worship, and we all understand that. But here's one of the beautiful things about God, and it's really interesting, isn't it? That God is invisible and actually brags about it. In fact, when he is written about in the New Testament, he says, God, that is the great God, the invisible God, the all-knowing God. One of his attributes is his invisibility, and he actually boasts about it. I can't be seen. Now, because there's a purpose to everything God does, I, I'm inquisitive, and I, so I studied that, and here's what I learned. In the ancient times when God was moving with Israel and he brought them out of Egypt, and he forced upon them, if you will, by his teaching. And when I say forced upon them, it, that it has to be received. But when God began to teach them as idolaters, they came out of Egypt and the Egyptians worshipped everything that moved and, and some things that didn't. In fact, the Egyptians believed they not only worshipped the sun, but they taught that there was a beetle of, that pushed the sun across the sky, and they worshiped that too. So everything that was worshiped that was a thing, so God had to retrain them in his invisibility. But something started to happen, because this is what God knew about human beings that they didn't know nor have the science to understand. What we know now by science is that when you can't see a thing as an image, you have to imagine a thing in your mind which becomes a spiritual trait. And, and when you develop the ability to envision God and build a relationship with God in your spirit, but he's invisible. See, when you make God into an image, you bypass the place in your spirit and your brain of creativity. Someone asked me recently, and this is a truth for me, I don't know how you feel about it, but I, for a great book that's made into a movie, I'm a reader, I love to read. I've never seen the movie version that was as good for me as the book. Now, what does that show you? I don't know if that's true for you or not, but it is for me. Because my mind, inflamed by my spirit, has a greater ability to envision the book's realities than Hollywood does. That's why God insisted on being invisible. Because when you develop a relationship with an invisible God that you worship, but you have to imagine and, and see him in your spirit, it also develops the part of your brain that makes you creative. See, the body of Christ ought to be the most creative, powerful people in the world because we don't worship things that you see. We worship a God that can't be seen. And actually, in ancient times, and even today, it is a reality that Jews, for that reason, scientists say this are creating more new inventions and patents than any other race of people. And they say, scientists say, one of the reasons is because of their early development of worshiping an invisible God. When you are an idolater and you, and you take God out of the spiritual and make it out of a rock or a, or a whatever, then you rob your brain's ability to be forced into a relationship with a God that created you but that you can't see. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when you understand that, just get happy about the fact that our God is invisible. It's a good thing because it creates an opportunity for you. He is invisible. So God's response. I, I read for you in the scripture the list of the things that God would call sin. So God's response is what? Well, I'm going to tell you that God's response is judgment. But is it eternal? Is it eternal? Judgment, and everyone that sins is lost? No. And we're going to go through those verses. Is it hellfire judgment for everyone that sins? No. 
There are three dimensions here of God's judgment that he manifests that I think that's why I call this a different kind of judgment. Because typically Christian people, from Catholic to Armenian branches of Pentecostalism and everything in between, uh, they, they put some idea of judgment having to do with punishment, eternal darkness, damnation, fiery pit, demon possession, and all kinds of horrible things. And that's kind of the alpha and omega of judgment. It is, it is really bad. Well, this is not good, but it's a different kind of judgment, but it is nonetheless judgment. I'm going to read it to you in three verses. Verse number 24, as a result of this list of what Paul calls sin in Romans chapter 1, suppressing truth, not acknowledging or glorifying God, unthankful, futile thinking, prideful, and making images that you call God, which replaces God. Verse number 24, therefore, or because of that, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, which is a repeat of what one of the things we already read. So he says the first thing God's going to do is, and I want you to mark this phrase because God's going to use it here through the scripture three times. Gave them up. In verse 24, he gave them up to uncleanness in their heart. In verse 26, he gave them up to vile passions. In verse 28, he gave them over to a debased mind. So the first giving over, which is a judgment from God, is to your own heart's desires. A second giving them over is to their passions unbridled. And the third giving them over is to a debased mind. Here's what I want you to get tonight. I want you to get that what we understand from this passage and this chapter, and we can go as deep as you want it to go, and we can't finish it all tonight. I hope it sparks something in you where you want to study this. But here's what we understand from this. God made us and knows how we are made. And in God making us, he made us God-like in that. We can choose and we can make decisions and we can create. And we're, the, we're not an animal on the planet. God made us in his image. But he apparently also knew our propensity for evil that was potential ever since the garden. And so God's, one of God's manifestations of his grace that you may never have heard before. And this is not just for believers. For every human that lives, and you can call it conscience, you can call it what you will, but God puts a governor on us so that we don't go but so far. He, he govern, there, there's an internal governor on our behavior. We don't go there. Now, you can short circuit that. Some people do that with alcohol. Uh, Dr. Drew, who is a guy who's on television in the U.S., I don't know that he is here but he has a, a, a program because he has a rehab center in Hollywood, and it's kind of a, a bit of a reality program because he rehabs famous celebrity people. But he also teaches some pretty good things. I heard him say something one time about alcohol that I've never forgotten because he rehabs a lot of people who are alcoholics. And, he was, and an alcoholic was arguing with him that she was not, that she was not. I drink occasionally, but I am not an alcoholic. And I'll never forget this. This wasn't a spiritual program, but it has spiritual intent, import. Dr. Drew said to her, well, let me ask you this. Have you ever done anything under alcohol's influence that you later regretted? Because that's one of the signs that you're an alcoholic. You, you allow yourself to drink enough that you do things you regret when you have your right mind. If you do that, you're going too far. So see, alcohol or drugs or other kinds of things can short circuit what God actually put there, which is a governor that's natural. But here's what God says. I'm going to release a judgment on these people who reach this dimension of sin, and here's my judgment. And I want you to hear this, and I hope the same cold chills go over you that went over me when I realized what this meant. 
God said, my judgment is, I'm going to turn you loose to do everything you think you really want to do. And I'm going to see how that life works out for you. I'm going to take the governor off of you. I'm going to remove my grace from your life. I'm going to let you perform everything you've ever thought as the most vile and filthy act you could ever dream up and see how you like that kind of life. Because you don't want me. You've made a laughing stock of me. You've made me as God into a, a little rock or a, or a sun or a river or a tree or, or a boat or a car or a person or a bank account or a retirement fund or a money or a job. See, we do that all the time. I pastor people who, when they came to God desperate because they were broken and hungry and lost, and God saved them, and gave them back their right mind, and we started pastoring them and loving them and teaching them the Word of God. And in a year or two, they got their education finished, and then they got a great job. Then it became a great career. Then they became the CEO. Now they hardly come to church. And I said to a man one time, don't forget that I met you when you didn't even own a pair of socks. And God cleaned you up. And God gave you a life. And God restored your family. And God brought your wife back home. And God gave you beautiful children. And now that thing that he gave you to make a living has, has now replaced him as your God. You're too busy for the things of God now. That's a tragedy. So God says, here's what we'll do. One of my forms of judgment is, I'll give you up to what you think you really want. Go for it. So what does he do? Verse 24, he gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Number 26, he gave them up to vile passions for even their women. Watch the perversion. Anytime the total presence of God is removed, there is always perverseness there. He gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for, for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which is due. This is obviously talking about homosexual lifestyle, and the, and the homosexual lifestyle in this passage is the result of God turning you over to a behavior you would never dream. Verse number 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Then he lists. Now, he lists now what kind of person you have the capability of becoming if he lifts his grace from you. Did you know that unbelievers don't understand how much grace they're under? They don't. A few months ago, there was a desperate father who brought his teenage daughter up to the altar for me to pray with her. And she was a beautiful girl, but she was full of rebellion. She was, I don't know what her pain was that caused it, but she'd been cutting herself and she had piercings everywhere and tattoos and clothing all askew and just, just wanted to paint. And, she said, and, and I said to the father and kind of looked at her and said, what are we praying about? And he said, well, she doesn't want to live. And I said, okay. And I asked her her name. And I said, you don't want to live? How old are you? She said, 17. I said, why don't you want to live? I just, there's nothing to live for. I don't want to live. And I could tell that it was just total anger, maybe against her father and mother, others, disappointment in life. And I don't know, just by the anointing, I never said this the same way to anyone before, but I said to her, let me ask you something. Are, are you a believer? Are you a Christian? Do you serve Jesus? She said, no. I said, well, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. I've been asked to pray for you. Would you give me permission to pray the prayer that I feel like praying? She said, what's that? I said, I'd like to pray and ask God to remove totally from you his grace for five minutes. Just for five minutes, I want you to know what it feels like because you don't know darkness like the darkness of no grace. Even those who, are, who feel like they are the furthest from God are under his grace. She looked at me and she said, I don't think I want you to pray that prayer. 
I said, why? Because you believe that there is some dimension of God's grace on your life? She said, I don't know. I think so. I I don't want to find out. I said, then you sure don't want to die. That's the last thing you want to do, is die in your condition. And, And God did some sweet things there ministering to her. But it was really sort of a revelation to me too. Because even when I was saying that to her by the Spirit, it made me afraid. And even as I was saying that to this confused and angry, bitter young woman, and I'd been, I was the pastor and I just finished the preaching and I was the one doing the praying, but I turned a finger back toward me and to my own heart. And I said to the Father, please, I don't ever want to be in that position myself. Don't ever take your grace from me. I don't even realize how covered I am. Sometimes when I think I'm having it rough, I have no idea how rough it could be, but for your grace upon me. So this strange kind of judgment is God saying, you think you want that so much that you've kicked at me until I'm going to turn you over to that and let you have it. What kind of person do we have the potential to become? When God gives us over to a debased mind, verse 29 says that they were then filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. It's interesting how God sees that. You know, that's one of the places that we're living now and we're seeing in our world is that there are people that that feel like they're good people and they're not practicing some of these perverse ways but they're defending those who do and feeling good about themselves for that. I was in a restaurant years ago, and one of our children, I forget which one, but they were very young. We were out of town, and we'd gotten up early, and we went for breakfast, and I was getting breakfast for them, and there were two men that had obviously been out partying all night, were still somewhat inebriated or drugged, and they were making out with each other uh, unbelievably uh, openly in the next booth. And my child was looking at them so odd. And, and, I, and they were about four or five years old. And I wasn't ready to explain that behavior. And so I just said uh, to them, and our waitress walked up about that time to bring some coffee or whatever. And I said, would you all abstain or whatever here in public like this with, with, with children and all involved? And you know what? They said, Yes, sir. And they just straightened up and started with their breakfast. But we got an unbelievable tongue lashing from the waitress who said, I don't choose that lifestyle, but I will defend to the death their right to do that. And I said, in front of a four-year-old child in the middle of the morning, that's really something you want to defend to the death? But see, that spirit is named in this list. I I won't necessarily participate in some of those behaviors. See, that's the whole politically correct environment we're in. I won't participate in that, but I'm going to defend everyone's right to be whatever they want. Even if if it's part of the destruction of a society, I I defend their right to do whatever they want. you're, You're acting like those who are turned over to themselves. And if you are, you're in the most fearful place you could be. It's one, of, it's one of the forms of God's judgment. See, we've become so insensitive to some of the things God called judgment from ancient times until we don't even understand that that should be a barometer of our condition. Did you know for 
uh, 2,000 years of God dealing with His people Israel throughout their sojourn and the establishment of the land that God always addressed debt as a curse. And it's like the people of God now have totally forgotten that. If I can borrow it, if I can sign on the line, if I can get it, if somebody will give me a loan, I'll, get, I'll, I'll incur all the debt. I, and have no idea that God's always looked at debt as a curse. God's intention for his people was, be, was to be the lender and not the borrower. That doesn't mean that you never make a loan. We have in, what in our, ch- our church we call, I'm working with all of our church and our church to be totally debt free and, and be the lender and not the borrower. And we have in our church a rejoicing time with people that we call ABM. ABM debt free means all but the mortgage. There are debts that aren't bad debts if it's an appreciating asset, but it may be the mortgage on your house, but no other debt. I don't, we don't have credit card debt. We don't have automobile debt. We don't have any kind of debt except on our house. That's, that's, one of the champ, that's one of the levels that we champion for people to reach because heavy debt, and that's one of the signs that grieves me about my precious nation, the United States of America. We are under a curse as a government. We, own, we owe $18 trillion that will never be paid back. Never be paid back. You say, wow, that really sounds hopeless. Do you understand how much $18 trillion is? Let me tell you something I read the other day. This will give you some perspective. I read something the other day that said, how much is a billion? And it was in the context of talking about how much our government is spending on interest on this loan. And it said, because they just throw around billions like it's nothing. And this little uh, uh, writing said, how much is a billion? Well, it said, if we're not talking about dollars, a billion seconds, and we'd be in 1959. A billion minutes, and Yeshua would be walking the planet. That's what a billion in a time measurement is. And a billion dollars, we've spent eight of those while you read these two lines. We'll never get there from here. If, they, if, they, if something isn't restructured or we don't get a jubilee year and everybody just say, you're forgiven, we'll never catch up. And so our grandchildren and their grandchildren will be stuck with, with the bill. That's a curse. That's not the blessing of God. The Bible says that the Lord gives blessing and adds no sorrow with it. That's added sorrow. I got this benefit, but it's long gone, and now I owe more than I can pay. Come on. As the people of God, let's live a life that's so exemplary of the blessing of God on our lives because some of these things are actually a form of God's judgment. Because you didn't do it my way, I'll turn you over to that. You want it that bad? I'll let you have it. How many of you are thankful for any unanswered prayers from years ago that you're so thankful now God didn't answer? I'll tell you what, if you ever see an old girlfriend from 40 years ago, (laughs) or boyfriend, and you're like, oh, thank you, Jesus, for not answering that prayer. I actually prayed and asked you to give me them, Lord, forever. It's like the fellow that married a gal that was uh, an unbelievable singer. She wasn't the best looking gal you'd ever see, but she was an unbelievable singer. And when she got all fixed up and made up and dressed nice, she wasn't bad. So he finally married her, went on a honeymoon. First morning, he wakes up before her. He looks over there and he says, hey, sing, baby, sing. That's not right. That, on, a, on, on so many levels, that's not right. So let me finish with this. God gave them up. Is this the irreversible end? The good news is it is not. I want you to look with me at chapter 2 of Romans, the first four verses. Because as you know, the chapter demarcations weren't there in the original text. They're just there so we can find the address. So the subject stays the same. Quickly, look what he says. Therefore, you are inexcusable, old man, whoever you are who judge. Oh, wow. See, God's always going to turn the coin over. So before you get to feeling really good about yourself because you don't fulfill every bad thing on that list he just read that those do participate in who've been turned over, 
He said, while you're feeling real good about yourself, you are inexcusable. Whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things are doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Now here's the key in verse 4. This is a beautiful passage. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? So here's the balance. I just spent the last 20 minutes talking to you about the horrendous conditions that exist a lot of places in our world because people are under judgment and have been turned over to themselves. Some of the perverseness that's in the world now and those who are militantly uh, marching for those rights. One of our suburbs in North Dallas recently, the city council of this bedroom community suburb that's as conservative as can be, jumped up and just overnight passed this unbelievable what they call hate crimes law against all kind of people including the LGBT and transgender community and all that. There has never, I've lived there for 30 years. There has never been an event in, that I know of that's ever happened to anyone where anybody in that lifestyle was mistreated. But there are people who can't wait to get these laws on the book and go to the extreme to defend something that hasn't even taken place. Turned over. Turned over. God says, you want to do that and be that and say that? I'll turn you over to that opportunity and see how you like that. But then he says, wait just a minute now, because there's always a balance. So God says, wait just a minute now. To all the rest of you, before you judge the people who've fallen into those horrible conditions, I'm still working with them. So don't judge them harshly. Love them. Preach to them. Share the gospel. Share the love of Jesus. Consider yourself. Be thankful because any one of us could be guilty of any of those things. And then he says, because the only way you can find yourself judging them is this. You must despise the riches of his goodness, his forbearance, and long-suffering, and don't know that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. So God has them on a path. They're under judgment right now. And they're going to come to a place where they're going to be so disgusted by the choices they've made. They're going to say, God, please find a way back for me. This is the moral of the story that's one of my favorite ones in the New Covenant, which is in Luke 15, that we call the prodigal son. Isn't that his story? He takes his father's wealth and he goes to another country and he does every despicable thing you can imagine into the depths of darkness and sin and then runs out of money and runs out of hope and runs out of friends. And the Bible says in the pig pen, he came to himself. And said, my father's servants are living better than I am. I'm going to return to him and say, I'm not worthy to be your son. But if you'll just let me be a servant, I would be better off as a servant than where I am now. And you know what? The hand of God was with that boy all the time. When he was partying, he was there. When he was drunk, he was there. When he was high, he was there. When he was sleeping around, he was there. When he was bragging on his money, he was there. When he was insulting his father, God was there. God was there with him and never left him. And then when the boy came to himself in the stench of a pig pen, God was there and said, good move, go home. Your father's waiting on the front porch. And they were reunited. That's the beauty of the story. Let me finish with one more verse. Because God's different kind of judgment is designed to get us sick of our condition enough to turn to him. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9 is the only passage that I'll read other than our Romans text, 
but it fits so well that I have to finish there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and you can put it on the screen if you're doing that behind me. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 9. And, and Paul wrote this epistle as well and really ties it in with Romans 1. And he says in verse 9, do you not know? And remember our question now is when you've been turned over as a form of judgment to your own doings, is, is that for good? Is that irreversible? Is that a judgment you'll never recover from? Verse 9 says, do you not know? And I'm going to ask you to do your own inventory because I'm not your judge. There may be someone in this room that has been turned over. And you're involved in a behavior or a thought life or a practice that is on this list. And God is still reaching for you. In fact, it's part of his plan. God loves you so much that if he can make you disgusted with yourself enough to turn to him, it's a good thing. So he says, do you not know? Look at the list. You do your own inventory. That the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. That's a tough list. There's a lot of things on that list. There's sexual behavior. There's inappropriate monetary behavior. There's mental behavior against those that have things you don't and you hate them for it. There's, there's soulish behavior. There's physical behavior. It's a judgment that happens to people who are turned over and the governor's been taken off and the restraint of grace has been removed. And then Paul gives us the best word we're going to hear all night. And this is our answer, that it's not irreversible. Because the next verse, Paul says, and of such were some of you, but you are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified. So Paul was writing to a Christian church and said to them, I'm going to list every awful thing that people get involved in that destroys their lives. But before I allow you to think that that's an irreversible condition that you'll never recover from, let me remind you that I'm aware, because I'm your pastor, that a lot of you in this congregation came out of those behaviors. But you've been washed. I love these terms, sanctified. These are subjects to themselves that could take all week. Sanctified is a beautiful word in the scripture that means separated to God. The ultimate sanctification is when Yeshua returns and sets foot over here on the Mount of Olives and we're reunited with him. That's the ultimate, literally in the scripture, that's the word used, sanctified. Sanctified means separated to to God from the world. But it means that spiritually now. We're sanctified. We've been separated from the world and joined to God. And then he says, you were washed, sanctified, and justified. Now I could give you the Greek and the Hebrew and the guilt removal and the, and, and, and the whole part of the, 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 the imperfect record of mine was placed on the broken body of the sacrifice lamb of God. And I could go into all of that about justification. But let me give you a really simple layman's definition that I enjoy because it's a play on words, but it works and it's not inaccurate. It's one of the most beautiful concepts in scripture of forgiveness. That's a beautiful word, isn't it? Forgiveness. Justification, without getting complicated, just remember this. It's a play on words, but it's accurate and it works. Justification means just as if you had never sinned. 
just as if you had never sinned. So when he washes you and you are joined to him and he puts his arms around you, he looks at, at, at you as though you had never sinned and can't remember it because he casts it to a place that's, that's, that's infinitely far that will never be found. I'm going to close and pray with you in just a minute, but for those of you that are, that are astronomers or geologists or mathematicians or computer nerds or whatever you are, and you enjoy this, think of this, because there's purpose in everything God says. God says that he will forgive us and cast our sin as far from us as the east is from the west. Now, I'm an inquisitive person and a contemplator, so, and I teach the word and have for 40 years, so I have to ask questions. When I'm reading it, I ask about everything. So I was reading that recently in my own devotional time, and I asked the Lord, you could just as easily have said north to south, right? Why did you say east to west? And then it came to me, no, 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 you need to study your globe. Listen to this carefully. If you take the globe of the world, if you travel north to south in an airplane that's circling the globe, when you reach the North Pole and you continue in your direction, you are immediately headed south. And when you reach the South Pole and continue, you are immediately going north. So north to south is a measurable distance, and we know exactly how far apart that is. But if you get in that same airplane and start flying due west, if you fly west for a hundred years, you will never be flying east. And then if you turn around and start to fly east, you can fly east for a hundred years and you will never be flying west. That's why he said, when I wash you, and when I justify you, and when I sanctify you, I cast your sins as far from me. Not, it would be good if he would just cast them as far as the north is from the south. I'd take that. But God says, no, that's not good enough because they would eventually resurface because we have to change directions. If it's north to south, it's a long way, but it's still measurable. I want to cast them so far from you that it's in an immeasurable distance that will never be reached or satisfied. Your sins will never be found against you again. Bow your heads with me if you would and close your eyes for just a moment. We've talked for the last 30 minutes or so about sin, missing the mark. And here's the good news and the bad news. The bad news is all of us have. No one in here free of guilt. All of us have missed the mark at one time or another in our life. The good news is the fix for that is in. It's all been arranged. It's already paid for. I wonder if there's someone in this room, I'm going to ask you respectfully to bow your head and close your eyes as I asked a moment ago, because I want to get really intimate with someone between them and God. It's not even my business. I'm going to ask someone in this room to do a personal inventory of their life and say, I wonder if this is what's happened to me. I pray that God hasn't turned me over to myself. It might be one of the most terrorizing forms of judgment there is. Flames of hell wouldn't be as bad as turning me over to myself with no grace and no light and no way out. And every horrendous thing I could ever imagine I would participate in with nothing to stop me, running down a steep hill with no brakes. Someone in this room may be in that condition. I can't believe, Pastor Mike, I can't believe in the secret place of my heart. I can't believe some of my behavior. I can't believe I've done some of the things I've done, thought some of the thoughts I've thought, gone some of the places I've gone, said some of the things I've said. What is wrong with me? Why am I here? Come on, there is redemption for you tonight. The God of all redemption and all forgiveness and all love is in this room. 
And all you got to do is say, God, whatever it was that caused me to be so self-willed that I missed the signs and the speed bumps didn't slow me down, and I pushed the limits long enough until you just said, let me just turn you over to yourself for a while and see if that's what you really want. And what you're saying in your heart tonight is, that's not what I want, God. I don't want to be turned over to myself. I need you as the captain of my ship. I need you on board my life. I can't go another day without you. If you want God in your life, you don't want God to feel ignored or overlooked or bypassed anymore. But you can say, God, I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to help me tap the brakes. I want you to help me get a hold of this thing. I want you to help me turn it around. I want to live a life that's pleasing to you. I want to live a life that's pleasing to you. If that's you, just between you and the Lord, I want you to slip up your hand right now let him see it. This is not for anyone else. Nobody's looking around. Everybody has their head down. Everybody has their eye closed. And God is looking on every hand. Thank you for that hand, dear. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand. I'm going to see it every time I see one, just to let you know that are praying. I need some intercessors just to turn up the heat a little bit in this room. God is going to do something great. Thank you for that hand and that hand and that hand and that hand. God's going to help you. You're going to come home. You're going to find your way. You're going to step out of the darkness. God has saved you from yourself you're not going to destroy yourself you're not going to be lost you're not going to be in darkness thank you for that hand and that hand and that hand thank you sir and that hand now we're going to pray father in the name of your son yeshua we bring these souls before you maybe 12 or 15 at least, that have raised their hand. And maybe those that couldn't quite find the courage to raise their hand, but they feel it in their heart. It's just as good. They feel it in their heart. They're turning their face toward you. I pray that you forgive us, Lord, all our sin. Everywhere we've missed the mark. And most of all, God, forgive us, forgive us for those ways and those times that we ignored you and willfully pushed on past what our conscience was trying to tell us. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me for my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness and come into my heart. I wonder, people of God, if you would join me in leading us in a short prayer, and I'm going to ask all those who would pray this with us. And it's going to be a prayer of redemption. It's going to be a prayer of salvation. It's going to be a prayer of repentance. And your name is going to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. People of God, pray it out loud so that those that may be praying it for the first time in this room tonight won't feel alone. Pray this. Say, Lord, forgive me for all my sins and come into my heart. The rest of my life belongs to you. I'm finished with the world and with darkness, and I come into your light. I receive you now, Yeshua. In every part of my life, I'm yours. And I thank you that I'm washed and that I'm sanctified and that I'm justified. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a great hand tonight. He's a good God.